Today, we're going to have a different conversation. I want to take you back, back to the spring of 1985. There were two young men, each in all honesty, probably as clueless about finance as the other. They were graduating from the London School of Economics that summer. Both were interviewing at Salomon Brothers, the muscular bond trading US investment bank, bristling with ego, schutz par, and on a mission to dominate global debt and equity trading. These two had made it through five rounds of ego bruising interview combat. One was blonde, engaging, articulate, some would have described him as a preppy, an American who had added the LSE to Princeton, and he was very charming. The other was me, not blonde, possibly engaging, occasionally articulate, suppressing an ego based on much, not much more than hope and full of hot air, and not really clear what a bond actually was, but playing the game. Two candidates in the running and one place left on the fabled Salomon Brothers graduate training program. Well, I lost and my guest today won. I joined Citibank, who then paid only half of the huge starting salary of Salomon Brothers, but the world won because within four years, your blockbuster book was blasting through the charts, immediately iconic and remaining so today, 35 years later. There's only one liar's poker. So Michael Lewis, author, raconteur, investigator, podcaster, journalist, and visiting fellow at the University of California, Berkeley, welcome to the Money Base podcast. Simon, it's a delight to see you again. And there's so much wrong with that introduction <laughs> that I don't even know where to begin. But in the first place, you frame it as the two of us enduring the same brutal meritocratic scrutiny. In fact, uh, I went through none of those brutal rounds of interviewing at Solomon Brothers. I had dinner with the wife of the man who ran Solomon Brothers International. At the end of it, she said, you must come work for my husband. So, so you were engaged in one form of capitalism, and I was engaged in another form of capitalism. Uh, and, and I never would have gotten through a round, much less five rounds. Well, I'm really, really disappointed because it's made me seem somewhat brighter than I really was. But anyway... <laughs> <laughs> and, well, and, and, and the punchline is the bank you went to join ended up acquiring the bank I went to join, right? Mine yes, went out of, yes, mine went out yes. of business. So it, well, it's pretty clear which bank had the beat on the talent. <laughs> well, along with millions, I'm an unashamed fan. I really appreciate you taking the time. But I'd just like to go back to the beginning because you were born in New Orleans, but I think you weren't the first Lewis to move there. Oh, God. Uh, well, so the first Lewis sent that my ancestor, my father's great, 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 great grandfather um, was Joshua Lewis. And he was sent by Thomas Jefferson. Some dispute about whether he was sent to receive the, 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 the territory, the Louisiana territory from the French or simply to be the first chief justice of the Louisiana territory. But he was the first chief justice and he wrote the first legal opinions. Uh, Joshua Lewis. So, and my family has been in New Orleans since 1803, since then, on that side, and never left. My mother's side, uh, who my father refers to as, as carpetbaggers, showed up in like the 1840s. Uh, but both, that's not a, you know, it is, this is going to sound strange, maybe not to an Englishman, but to uh, an American. And a family that arrived in New Orleans in 1803 could still, when I was a kid, be viewed as Aravistes by the old French families. And wow. uh, I had a girlfriend in high school whose family had been there, you know, a hundred years before mine, and we were kind of the newcomers. That's amazing. Now, how did New Orleans shape you or influence you for the future? You know, I would never have been able to answer that question while I was there, except it left me wholly unprepared for, you know, the American way of life, uh, because it was, it wasn't a place that was defined by what you did. Uh, it was defined by who you were, who your mother was, who your father was, where you went to school, what neighborhood you lived in. It was, someone described it once, not as the um, the southernmost city in North America, but the northernmost city in South America. And, and there's really some truth to that. I mean, the only two really close relatives that I have who left both married Brazilian women. Um, and I think that, um, so it left me, it left me at a kind of, weird angle to American life um, that has been useful. I think so you ask, it didn't prepare me in this way, but it it, it gave me a different view of the world that I think I might have had. I grown up in you know, Cincinnati. Uh, and it also, it was a storytelling culture. It was an oral storytelling culture, but it was 
it moved slowly enough that it had time for story. And that probably was was useful to me. I grew up listening to people who had sort of an obligation to be entertaining when they open their mouths. And and that that is that's also a little different from the rest of the country. So say that it had some influence that way, but it was in very indirect. Right. And you let slip, I read, that um, your mother said you made my life sheer hell. And I just <gasps> wondered how you achieve how did you achieve that? <laughs> Someone's been doing their homework. <laughs> Someone's been reading up on the on the subject. I know um, I've got an important guest coming up. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, you know, I the context for that was I was trying to, I think, alleviate a mother's concern that her son was causing her life to be had, had made her life miserable for some period of time. And my, I and I thought back to my mother and I being at war from about the age of nine to about the age of 15 and and her turning to me one time in the kitchen and it was a moment what was so memorable about it well, it wasn't in the heat of battle it was it was in the course of a very calm conversation about something else and she looked at me just kind of curiously and said you know for seven years you've made my life sheer hell and i remember even in that moment thinking yeah i i win <laughs> that there'd been there'd been something my mother was um is though she's mellowed a bit, um, a real warrior, uh, like a very, she was a really good athlete, very competitive. Um, and um, so uh, she was something to push up against. And I think that I, I think that in my development, I did a lot of pushing up against her. Uh, but, and it was, you know, any camera on the, on the event would, would, would any, anybody watching it would think nothing but ill of me and nothing but well of her. It was all, it was all, I was a problematic child for a long stretch and expressed itself mainly this way. Um, so anyway, I don't know where that, I don't know how that leads to my career in any way or, or what I ended up being, but it was, it was a formative period of life. Well, we're getting there, but one step in between, you go to Princeton and then you go to the LSE. And at the time, the LSE, might still be, was had over 40% overseas students and it was dubbed Let's See Europe. But I wonder what it was that you took from the LSE. Well, you, we met at the LSE. Um, I remember my first impression of the LSE coming from Princeton, and this is what, 1983? Uh, was how impoverished it was. I couldn't believe how starved of resources it was. But this was true of the whole of England in that moment. Um, so the, the it was people used to say at Princeton uh, that getting an education at Princeton was trying to get a, like trying to get a drink of water from a fire hose. That there was so much coming at you, so many resources being thrown at you, that you were just you were overwhelmed by it in a good way. I remember. When I got to the LSE, I realized that getting an education here is going to be like getting a drink of water from a, a drinking fountain. That, you know, whether you have to push the button really hard and put your mouth really <laughs> close to the, the, the spigot because it's not coming out thick and fast. And um, and when I realized that, it was actually a wonderful experience. I had um, I had really good teachers. Mervyn King, governor of the Bank of England, was my teacher. Um, Morris Perlman was a wonderful economist who kind of took me on and just kind of kicked my mind into gear. But um, but it was a, it was broader than that. It was um, it was being thrown into a completely alien environment and learning how to flourish. I just I, I loved it at the end. And London was of course fabulous. Um, one of the most memorable things about that stretch was because the year before we got there. Um, the student athletic union had squandered the entire, you know, hundred thousand pound athletic budget on a racehorse and it had become a national scandal. It was in the newspapers and the horse wasn't even any good that when we got there, there was pretty strict, um, controls over where the athletic money went and there weren't any teams or weren't many teams. And we had a basketball team and because we had a, a real basketball team with LSE on the front of it. We were supplied with unbelievable resources. So though, while, they, while the school itself seemed kind of down at the heels, that we were put up in bed and breakfasts around Europe to play basketball games. And that was a, that was a total gas. I mean, a really memorable part of the thing. Um, so it, it, and, I guess, and I guess the last thing it did for me was 
I mean, I'd come from being an art history major in college and I had very self-consciously gone out to study ec economics because I'd realized this was a language I would maybe need to speak if I was going to move through the world. It just, I felt the world felt like a conspiracy of people who understood this language. And it did teach me the language and it led to me, you know, kind of indirectly, but led, led to me ending up on a Wall Street trading floor, which ended up with me writing Liar's Poker. So that's great because that takes us to the Salomon Brothers juncture. I mean, I knew going back that I was trying to blag my way into a job for I wasn't qualified, but you have said that you were a fraud joining them. Why was that? Oh, I didn't know. I didn't know or care. <laughs> uh, I mean, it wasn't you at least probably <laughs> cared. Um, it was, uh, I mean, we were all frauds. It was everybody should have felt imposter syndrome and only the idiots didn't. Um, it, it, it was <laughs> because, I mean, once you got in, you realize the business had changed so much so fast that even the people who were running the business didn't completely understand the business. So to pretend as a student uh, that you were going to kind of, there was no one who was going to teach you this before you got there. Uh, you know, derivatives, uh, you know, uh, what was going on on a, on a, on a trading floor on any given day. This is all stuff you had to kind of learn on the job. So, uh, but I felt more, maybe more fraudulent than you because I knew I wanted to write for a living at that point. I, I, I published while I was at LLC, I started to publish magazine pieces. The Economist gave me my start and it, they didn't have my name on them, but, but I published a dozen pieces in The Economist my second year at the LLC. I was really kind of, I was a stringer for them for all over the paper. And, okay. and I, but they paid, they paid 90 pounds a piece, um, which you couldn't live on. Um, a piece might take you a month to do. Uh, so I, I just couldn't see a way to make a living at it. So, so, so when I went into Solomon Brothers, I went in knowing, well, I'm going to make some money here, maybe have an adventure that will be interesting and to, to write about one day. But I didn't go in thinking, oh, I'm going to have a career in finance. It was how long can I last? Um, which turned out to be not very long. Uh, so, so, that, so that, you know, I went in under false pretenses. Well, the economists were paying you 90 pounds. I had a job as a waiter at the Grosvenor House for that time. And I think that I would have been lucky to get one ninth of that for my endeavours. But per day, I just per want... day, though, right? Well, I, I think an evening at the Grosvenor House and yeah. you hope you're yeah. going to make some money out of the tips. Yeah. But um, I actually want to recount a story to you, Michael, before we before we get into uh, into lots of other things. But you were on the Salomon training program with our mutual friend, Ravi Joseph. Uh, he's had a very successful career at Goldman's and Morgan Stanley is founder and CEO of Mount Street Capital. But Ravi told me the story, which you may or may not have heard, is that he was assigned to the <laughs> mortgage bond traders. And as you've documented in your book, many of them were of Italian origin. They were larger than life. They were ebullient. And one day, Ravi arrived and he was taken aside by one of the senior mortgage traders who had a conversation that went something like, uh, now Ravi, Ravi, today, Tony Barola, one of our older traders, is going to come in and he's going abroad on holiday to Puerto Rico. And he's going to bring his suitcase in and he's going to put it in the cupboard by the toilets. And I want you and Joey, when he goes off to get a bagel at about 11 o'clock, to take the suitcase, to take it into the toilets, take out all his clothes and fill it with wet towels. <laughs> Ravi and Joey did that. And Tony Barola went to Puerto Rico. And apparently the next morning at 6.30, the one internal trading line was flashing and they knew it wasn't the client. They knew who it was. And when somebody eventually answered, this bond trader turned potential murderer said something like, when I'm back in New York, I'm going to get that bastard. <laughs> so that story was typical in many ways. One, it tells you many things. How much time people had on their hands to think of, <laughs> right? Different world. Two, that, that everybody knew get the get the new kid at the desk to do it so you weren't the one who got killed um but three the the kind of the joy of the place was that it was there was this like people didn't forget to have fun uh that there was there was still you know when you i think when you walk into a big hedge fund right now or you walk onto the trading floor of a big bank it's completely silent now it, and there's no, there's hardly any interactions, people staring at screens and you hear click, clicking, you don't hear really interaction. There was so much human interaction just in the business, in 
at that time, you were you were constantly shouting at the person next to you or across the desk from you or down the row from you that it just naturally led to other kinds of interaction. Um, you knew your neighbor. That's the you don't know your neighbor anymore. Uh, so and, and that it, had that not been true, I think it would have been very hard for me to write a book about it. I mean, right. what drove the whole thing was these human interactions. And that's been bled from the business. But wanting to or thinking that you're going to be an author is one thing. But but what took place that made you absolutely clear that this was your first story? It's funny. It wasn't that hard. Um, <laughs> it, it really wasn't that hard. Um, but what happened was I was I continued to write while I was there. And of course, I'm doing I'm, it's the natural thing to do is write roughly about what I'm doing all day. Um, and I got published in the, it's, it starts with this. I get published in the Wall Street Journal, the op-ed page, a long piece arguing that bankers are overpaid. And at the bottom, it says I'm an associate at Solomon Brothers in London. <laughs> this causes the roof to fall on me. The, 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 I, have a, I, I end up being kind of taken aside by the guy who hired me, the guy who ran Solomon Brothers International. And he says, you can't, you just can't do this. You know, this, this actually, he was on the phone with the board of directors all night trying to figure out what to do to suppress this thing because it, it looks so bad. And we agreed that I could, I said, I wasn't going to stop writing, but he's asked if I do it under my, another name. And I ended up doing it under my mother's maiden name, Diana Bleeker. So then I felt this liberty, like no one's going to know it's me. I can write about what I want to write about. And I, well, I did not put Solomon Brothers in it directly. I was putting kind of, I was describing scenes around me in magazines. I didn't do much of it, but I did like half a dozen of these things over a uh, two year and a half period. And every time I published one of these things, it would be mimeographed and distributed across the Solomon London trading floor. And I would see everybody reading it. So that it was essentially what I, it was, I didn't think of it this way, but it was market testing. It was like, if I write about this, people will read about this. The people, the very people who are more or less writing about. Um, so I knew that there was a market and I really enjoyed doing it. And I had the sense that this thing was happening on Wall Street that was a really important thing. And outside of Wall Street had, only the most partial view of what was going on um and that it was an arbitrage <laughs> i had informational I had an informational edge um and then one day um i get back to my house at hampstead and the phone rings and it's it's a, an editor from a publisher from simon and schuster who happens to be the father of the actor chevy chase uh, his name is Ned Chase, and he's a very senior editor at Simon & Schuster. And he's figured out who Diana Bleeker, my mother has made name, is. He's figured out it's me. And he's called to offer me a book contract. And so at that moment, I thought, you know, I, I'm, I, can, I, can, I, can make, I can make a living. I'm out of here. And that was, you know, two and a half years into it. I hung around for another few months just to, so, to get my bonus. And then I was out. Um, and I never... It seemed it was I tell you, the, there's a funny moment. This will give you a sense of the spirit of it all, because um, though it was kind of sneaky, it wasn't as sneaky as all that in that I told them when I was leaving that I was going to go write a book, book, book about Wall Street. I didn't exactly know what it was going to look like. I just knew. I, in fact, I kind of thought it was a more antiseptic history that led up to this thing. But but they take me into a room. They don't take me into a room to tell me you can't do this. You signed a non-disclosure agreement. Everything you saw here, you need to forget. None of that. They don't even care about it. Um, they take me into a room because they've come, they understand that I'm getting a $40,000 advance to write this book. And they just paid me 250. And they're thinking they're going to pay me twice that next, the next year. And they're actually worried about my mental health. They think, they think there's something we really like you. We really worried about you. Like, like, can we just can we just talk you down from this ledge? Because really, it's a mistake. You shouldn't. You just for your own sake, have a good career. Like, go make a lot of money. Don't go like blow it by trying to write some book, which will never happen. Um, so they were actually it was touching. They were really worried about me when I walked out, and I was I, I was kind of moved by it. It was very sweet of them. 
because they were probably in some sense right. I probably shouldn't have done it, um, but it all worked out. You couldn't make it up. Now, you've written, I think, at least 16 books. Three of them are films. You've been a New York Times bestselling author multiple times. What inspires you to write a book? It's a really good question because at the end of every book, I tell myself, pretend you're done. This is it. Uh, you, you don't have an obligation to write another one because you don't want to do it out of a sense of obligation because it's just what you're supposed to do. You want to do it because something special, so special walks in, you can't not write a book. So I try to start in that frame of mind. Um, I, I'm no longer an author. It, something really has to present itself for me to want, really want to do it. Um, and then what is it that causes me? Of course, this is a little bit of a conceit. Uh, and at some <laughs> point, I remember I'm an author and I go write bo a book. But um, what... What has to happen, a couple of things have to happen. Almost always in retrospect, starts with a character, but uh, sometimes I don't find the character, but for a question. I don't know. Uh, why are the Oakland A's winning so many games with no, no money? Uh, it, it, that led me to Billy Bean, but it's, so it kind of starts with a question. Uh, how did all these Wall Street firms filled with all these smart people blow themselves up? Starts with a question, but ends with these people who had shorted the market and been on the right side of the bet against the Wall Street firms, who were just wonderful characters. Um, I, th I think that without a character that I care about and that I think I can really make swing on the page, I, I certainly don't have a book. I don't because I don't write that kind of book. I don't write long arguments. I, yeah, it's their they're, they're narratives. Um, so character is sort of the, the primary ingredient. And then after that, I think it's a feeling that um, this subject is for some reason really important. And it may be delusional. Maybe I've just talked myself into it, but I've certainly talked myself into it. Um, and that the last thing, and this is a tr this is a Wall Street thing. Um, this has not left me. Uh, I always asked uh, ask myself, why do I have this story? Like it's like when someone presents you with a trade that seems like too good. To, mm -hmm. Like all right, if it's so great. Why do I have the opportunity to do it? Why haven't 6,000 people before me done it? So what is it that's giving me some sort of preferential, some sort of privileged access to this thing? And I kind of have to figure that out before I'm convinced that I should be doing it. Um, because I don't think the market's that inefficient. Uh, I think that it's a little inefficient. And so um, it, that question's oddly gotten a little easier to answer. Because sometimes the answer is they'll just let me in and they won't let anybody else in. Uh, and, and it's so the way the undoing project, for example, it's just a, that sometimes I get it's as simple as that. Um, but I have to feel like I have to feel it's And again, it may be pure delusion. I have to feel like I have an obligation because if I don't do it, it won't get done and it needs to get done. And th when I have that feeling, I'm on my way. Okay. Well, that, that leads us right into your new book, Premonition, A Pandemic Story. Um, I bought it on Kindle. I started reading it. I got increasingly drawn into the unfolding drama and didn't think I was going to be able to finish it in time for the interview, but I, I did. And you say in the introduction, I like to think my job is mainly to find the story in the material. And in this case, what did you discover? Um, well, that's a... That's a big question. Uh, the so to, to answer that question, I have to start. I have to back up a little bit. Um, I had the previous book before the premonition had been called the Fifth Risk, and it was really a series of magazine pieces that were just linked together, but they were so close in theme that they worked as a book. And that the it was it was me asking the question: What happens when Americans so misunderstand their government? so neglect their government that they don't even see the the risk management function that it serves all these risk management functions it serves and they they allow a president to completely neglect those functions uh because among other things a federal government is a manager of a portfolio of some of pretty serious risks you know whether it's climate risk or food safety or security of the grid or risk of nuclear weapons going off or risk of a pandemic. And it was pretty clear that we got into a situation in this country where we had 
we had let this thing, this tool for managing risk, ossify, decay. And I was asking myself in the course of the book, like, I don't know, I was saying, I don't know what's going to happen, but something's going to happen. So what happens? The pandemic happens. And um, the first thing I discover is that the tool for, and it's not me, it's the characters I find. So the first thing I discover is these characters, it, they're, and they're unbelievable characters. And they're essentially, it's essentially doctors. It's a book about the doctor's approach to the pandemic. And the doctors are differently, are they're placed in different parts of the system. One of them is a, a really on the ground battlefield command type local health officer who's been dealing with disease outbreaks her whole career. And you just haven't seen them because you don't think about multi-drug resistant tuberculosis or measles or HIV. But these are in some cases life and death things she's doing and she's mucking around in the community and social distancing people and doing things that make her unpopular. And But she's actually saving lives. So there's, there's that person. They're the people in the who, who wrote the pandemic plan for the United States during the Bush administration. Some doctors who were just brought in to think about the problem and who thought about it uh, very originally. And then there's this kind of this this almost science fiction character, virus hunter, uh, who's at uh, University of California, San Francisco, who is at the at the bleeding edge of using genomic information to, to hunt viruses, who was at, at the moment of the beginning of the pandemic in the process of using Mark Zuckerberg and Bill Gates's money to try to build a system of global tripwires to tell us when some no, new pathogen had leapt from animals into people. Um, and these characters all interact, just magic. It, it kind of happened as I was working on it, but they all have things to do with each other. And what they, what they teach me and teach the reader the same stuff that the characters in the big short teach the reader there are people inside of a broken system who understand the system better than the system does understand itself whose experience in the system sort of lead us to some insights about about how where the system is broken and why and the first thing that it kind of surprised me it shouldn't have what kind of surprised me was that the Centers for Disease Control, which was had a gold-plated reputation when going into the pandemic. It was, if you'd asked me which of the federal agencies has the capacity to withstand some, some horrible event, uh, I would have picked them maybe at the top. That even they had been their authority, their their guts, their nerve, their willingness to actually do their jobs uh, in the face of lots of controversy. Had, had been undermined. Um, and the, char the characters in the book actually know this going into the pandemic. And, and if you know their experience, you know that you, you kind of know what's going to happen, but you had to be really in the weeds in the system to see it beforehand. Um, mainly with the book, this is going to sound odd given the subject, given what a grim subject it is. Um, it was a total joy to write. I wonder if you're reading it, you can see this, that, that how much fun these characters might have been to write. They're so extreme. They're so it's they're so unusual um, that I wrote this thing. Um, it's the closest thing I've had as a writer to the experience I've had described to me where, where you're just a conduit for the story, where I just get out of the way of this thing because the, the what's coming at you is so good. Um, it was totally fun to write. And I think it was fun to write because whenever you're dealing with um, passionate, informed people who understand the world better than the world understands itself, but but they're having trouble getting their message across, you've got you've got all the ingredients of something that's going to just light up a page, and that that's so that these people the biggest the biggest thing I discovered with these people that they existed. I mean, I had no idea, and I suspect no one, no one else in my country did either. That that George Bush back in 2006 asked his people, like, "What's the plan for a pandemic?" And they said, "Well, we don't have one." And then he brought in these doctors, uh, these two doctors, who from the ground up really thought about, like, reinvest investigated what had happened back in 1918, um, uh, made arguments to the public health community about what could be done. 
actually kind of reconceive what you would do in the big in the very beginning of a pandemic. I didn't know that. I didn't know any of this history. Um, th so, um, so the people were the were the people in the middle of the book were the greatest discovery. The various the various dysfunctions, the specific problems in the system, and what caused them. That's an that's another order of discovery. So I, I, I will recount one vivid moment because hopefully our listeners will be going out to, to, you know, to download and buy that book. But when the health, or health uh, expert you talked about has to examine this dead corpse that's had tuberculosis and has to use garden shears because she's not getting any help from the doctors. That was, that was vivid. Uh, and well, I mean, stayed so with me for a little so while. Here, you know, she, this is the opening scene of the book, but she's, she's the local health officer of Santa Barbara County. She's been told that there is a corpse in the morgue that has died of tuberculosis. It's multi-drug resistant tuberculosis. She needs to know whether the corpse, whether the tuberculosis is in the lungs, because that's the, it doesn't spread unless it's in the lungs and it can appear in lots of different parts of the body. And so she needs to get some lung tissue and the coroner won't let her because he's got this study that says, that shows how dangerous it is to open up a body with tuberculosis that in the, that it, there is, are examples of the doc, of doctors being infected. Now she thinks this is a bullshit study and there's only one of them and she's going to do it herself. And he, and the sort of, it was the sort of the male uh, ruling order in Santa Barbara County, the sheriff, the coroner, the deputies all thought that, uh, if we don't do it, she won't do it. Like it just won't happen. And she insists on, it's like on the day after Christmas or the day before Christmas, I can't remember which, but she's coming from her Christmas tree. Uh, that she's, she says, okay, just leave the body out and I'll take care of it. And she gets there and they're all standing around. These guys are all standing around in hazmat suits. She's in like a <laughs> blouse and jeans. And the coroner has not even bothered to give her to, to show up with the tools in order to, to, to open a body. Um, he, all he's all he's got is a pair of garden shears and he thinks it's a big joke like oh this isn't going to happen and she gets up on top of the body and takes the garden shears and cuts it open from the, the, the front of her body open and, and grabs the lung and yanks it out uh and th they i mean they didn't know who they were dealing with uh, but this was just a way to it was a way of establishing who they were dealing with it was also this way of establishing and this is this was the tell how brave you had to be, and she had to be over and over as a local public health officer just to do her job, that the, the system really didn't respect this character. And, and because we'd gotten, we drifted far enough away from communicable disease being a widespread threat to people, that it wasn't top of mind for most people, that this person who controlled communicable disease became lower and lower status. And she had to assert herself in all kinds of crazy ways. I mean, reason like it, I mean, her her life, and it's, this is not just her. These are local public health officers around the country here. Um, it reads like a television show. You could, I, I kind of when I, when I just kind of learned how she led her life, I couldn't believe no one had moved in with cameras to to capture this. And that fact alone told you that if something bad really happens in this country. We have not empowered the people who actually are, might control it and explain it to us and lead us. They, they're not le they're not in really leadership positions. They don't have the power to do anything about it. Um, and she had told you that too. So, so that Michael, that I'm going to pause there because <clears throat> there are some memorable quotations. Um, some will remember them. Trump first said, it's one person coming from China and we have it under control. And then later it's like a miracle, it's going to disappear. But then you quote the medical professor at Stanford who said the virus posed no real threat. So as you put this story together, could it have been different under a different political administration or was it just that the system is structurally flawed? It was going to be bad in any case here. It didn't have to be nearly as bad as it was. I mean, when I wrote the book, right up to the moment of the of the vaccine appearing on the scene, um, there was this astonishing statistic that the United States had a bit, only a bit more than 4% of the world's population and more than 20% of the world's deaths. Going into the pandemic, well, before the pandemic, October of 2019, there had been this very elaborate study done with millions of dollars and hundreds of experts and lots of research that had taken a couple of years by an outfit in Washington called the Nuclear Threat Initiative. And they had coincidentally set out to ask the question which 
which how well prepared are various nations for a pandemic? And they ranked everybody. And they ranked us first and you second. The United States first and the United Kingdom second. And if you look at the outcomes, it, it's breathtakingly how bad, it, given, given how we were supposed to perform, how badly we performed. And um, if you just, all right, so even if you say, okay, it's not fair to compare the United States to South Korea or Japan or some other society where people actually obey their government. Um, or China, where they lock everybody in the rooms. Uh, if you if you compare the United States as the Lancet did um, a year ago now, a little more than a year ago now, uh, to just the other G7 countries, um, at that point they calculated that if we'd just done as well as the other G7 countries, we would have we'd have one hundred and fifty thousand people alive who are not alive. Um, so you got this situation. It, it, it would it was really bad. The point is that our response was really bad, and uh, how much better would it have been if someone else had been in power who was willing to 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 not use it as a way to divide the country, but to unite the country? Better. Hard to know how much better because, as the characters all show you running into the thing, the 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 enterprise that was meant to run the pandemic, the Centers for Disease Control had been pretty badly undermined in its in its willingness to to actually run the battlefield during a battle um i mean it, it's there's story after story in the book about about this sort of like what they what had happened was they'd been politicized going way back to the 1980s the person running the place had ceased to be a career civil servant and became a presidential appointee and a lot of things followed from that and um and basically the big thing that followed from that was that the cost of any kind of controversy um, had gone up. Um, at the same time, there had been no real existential risk to the country for a long time. And what the, what the CDC did in response was sort of retreat and become more of an academic institution. As Charity D says, the, the CDC should be renamed. It should be called the Centers for Disease Observation and Reporting because they don't control disease. They don't even try. And, and so we had essentially an academic institution that needed to wait. It felt it needed to wait for complete certainty before it acted. And you, that's simply not the, na the nature of pandemic control. You have to be at, way out in front of it and explaining to people why you're doing weird stuff when there doesn't seem to be any threat. Like why you're putting cardboard, uh, why you're putting plywood over windows when there's a blue sky because a hurricane's coming. Um, so you need you need to kind of lead that way, and they really weren't equipped to lead that way. So it it wouldn't have been great, but I, I think that it would have been better. And someone someone down the road will try to figure out how many lives Trump cost us, but he cost us some. So, yeah, I think what stood out before we leave this topic um, was that one statistic that they were testing in Zimbabwe before they were in California. So, huh. <laughs> well, they were testing in Zimbabwe before they were in California. And they were this. This is to me that anecdote that just leaps off the page is when we repatriated Americans from Wuhan in March, early March, late February, whenever it was, maybe it was even a little before that. Um, to, we repatriated them to Air Force bases in um, National Guard facilities in California and in uh, Omaha, Nebraska. And a doctor who's in the book uh, named James Lawler, who runs a federal medical enterprise in Omaha, Nebraska, wanted to test the 80 something people who'd come from Wuhan for COVID. Um, now, this is, seems like a pretty natural thing to do. <laughs> They've just come from Wuhan. You've extracted them because you're afraid they have COVID. The CDC had wouldn't test them, and he he it, the request goes all the way up to the the director of the CDC, and who sends the note saying, "I forbid you to test them uh, because testing them would be performing medical experiments on imprisoned persons." Now all these people wanted to be tested, so so it was as if it was as if they behaved as if they did not want to find COVID, and of course. You need to be just the opposite. You need to be the, you need to be incredibly aggressive in trying to detect disease in the very beginning of an outbreak, and they instead they sort of tried not to find it, and uh, and why why that is I'll leave to other people to speculate. But they but that that created all kinds of problems. Yeah. So let's tilt 
left or right. John Mason is a good friend of mine and later was Salomon Brothers head of European equity, he wrote me a note when he knew I was interviewing you and said, his brilliance is in taking big global issues and reducing them to an individual lived experience. And I thought that was a really nice encapsulation. But what do you think your strongest skill as a writer is? I, that's a very nice way of putting what I would have said that I what I do uh, is I do think that my job is to find people through whom I can tell stories, I, the stories I want to tell. And um, what I'm looking for is not just great characters on the page, but teachers, so, uh, people who can teach me and my reader. And I think that I'm good at finding those people. And it, it, it's, it's, it requires lots of trial and error, but I, I think I'm good at finding those people and building relationships with them that enable me to get sufficiently far into their lives that I can bring them to life on the page. Um, so that's, that's the, you know, if you were on the, if you were my subject, if, so if I, if I told you in, up front, that I, that you were Simon, you were going to be my next subject. And I told you what it was going to involve before I even finished, you'd be out the door so fast and down the road and I never see you again. It, <laughs> it, it is such a pain in the ass from the point of view of, for my subjects to do, to enable me to do what I do. So part of, I think, if you said, what are your, what like, what edge do you have? One edge I have is for whatever reason, I'm able to slowly persuade people to commit to do something that they never would commit to upfront. A bit like selling bonds of Solomon Brothers. And, and, and the, uh, so getting into their lives slowly, they're uh, turning my characters into frogs in boiling water, right? That, that, that getting in sufficiently, you know, persuading them to cooperate with this enterprise, which is, it, it's always hard, um, but I can't do it without their cooperation. And I've, I've tended, as time has gone on, I've tended to become more and more of a pain in the ass. I've tended to want more and more from these subjects and um, want so much that I couldn't, I wouldn't dare tell them what I, what I require up front, but um, have some, for some, some ability to, once I'm in a relationship with them, to lead them to where we need to go. So I want to turn to your book, The Undoing Project, which some have said may well be your, be your best book, um, how a Nobel Prize winning theory of the mind altered our perception of reality. And you can just tell me these two professors, I may pronounce their names incorrectly, Kahneman and Tversky, you say are more responsible than anybody for the powerful trend to mistrust human intuition and defer to algorithms. Now, were you screening Nobel Prize winners for an idea for a new book? <laughs> <clears throat> no, it's this is a really good example of how haphazardly my book subjects come come at me. Um, what happened was this: I published this book, Moneyball, um, that was about this professional baseball team finding that the market misvalued professional baseball players, using better data to find the mistakes the markets made about players, and the mistakes were as crude as not seeing the value of a player who just didn't look right in some way because he was not shaped like a baseball player. He was really good at baseball, but the, the, just his physical appearance um, deceived people uh, sufficiently that they could get that player cheaply. So this baseball team um, has already in its mind sort of classified the mistakes that scouts using their intuitive judgments are making. And they have a whole list of them. You know, it's like, Things that are really vivid, like foot speed or power, these are not going to go missed. But things that virtues that are really subtle, like an ability to see a ball coming at you 100 miles an hour and see whether it's one inch off the plate or one inch on the plate, uh, these things might be missed. Um, but they say so they've done this, and I've written a book about them. The book comes out and it gets reviewed by Richard Thaler, who would go on to win the Nobel Prize in economics. And Cass Sunstein, who's his writing partner and is a law professor at Harvard. And they say, they say, they review the book and they say, Michael Lewis in this book has failed to understand his own story. What it really is, 
they say, is a case study demonstrating the power of the work of Amos Tversky and Danny Kahneman, two Israeli psychologists. And I never heard of Amos Tversky or Danny Kahneman. So they were right. I mean, in a way I misunderstood that I thought, what, who are these people? And it turned out that Kahneman Tversky had done this work back in the 70s and 1980s to show the way the human mind was deceived when it was, when it, human decision making was warped by intuition and that the way our intu intuition misled us. And they had indeed basically anticipated what was going to happen in the market in ba for, for baseball players. So I got interested in them for that reason. Um, I wouldn't have written a book about them if that was all there was to them because I'd already written Moneyball. I got attracted to writing about them, one, because it turned out I had I had personal introductions to both sides of the collaboration. Amos Tversky was dead, but I knew his family. It just turned out. I taught his son without knowing I taught his son. And Danny Kahneman, the other side of the collaboration, lived a mile up the hill from me in Berkeley and was friends of friends. So I started talking to Danny Kahneman. And it became clear that not only was this work they had done together, I mean, of world historic importance, their work, among the other things it spins out, uh, is behavioral economics. I mean, they are the origin of behavioral economics. Um, but not only was the work really important and interesting, but their relationship was this platonic love story that was more intense than any real romantic love story that I'd ever read. So I had it was a, I had a love story to write that was a story of collaboration that had all of this intellectual consequence. And it was all done against the backdrop of the war and drama of, uh, in, in, the, in the early days of the, the Israeli state. Um, so uh, it, it was a challenging book to write for one, for one reason. Um, it was the only time I've had up to this point where I felt like I quite possibly couldn't get my mind around my characters' minds because their minds were so big. Uh, that I was only going to be able to partially envelop them as opposed to what I usually do, totally envelop them. I felt like I felt like I felt like um, the B student who was all of a sudden assigned to describe the A students, where I'd, I'd been spending my life describing C and B students, the people in finance and on sports. But these people were just a different order of intellect. So I, I was a little intimidated by the subject, but this but the material was so good. And to this day, it amazes me that no one has seized the book and made a film of it because it is, it's such a, it seems like a quiet story. It seems like a story of intellectual life. It is such a dramatic story, emotionally, physically, it's just a dramatic story. Um, so anyway, I, I love, I love writing it. Um, and uh, uh, it, it grew very naturally out of stuff that I'd already written. Well, by curious coincidence, um, I'm interviewing next week uh, Bridgewater's chief investment officer, a lady called Karen Carniel Tambour, and I was listening to some other interviews that she'd done, and she refers to your book, and she says it is a fantastic example of how you can get people and institutions to work better together. And so I guess my question is, what are the lessons that organizations and individuals should draw from their discoveries? Well, let's start. The, the first lesson is not they should draw is not from their discoveries, but from their actual collaboration. Neither of them do work that uh, on their own that it is it, it is as powerful as the work they do together. No one ever sees them working together. They go in a room, they close the door, and all anybody hears is laughter coming from inside the room. They're just, they're just shooting the shit and they're just talking and it's just going places. And um, why is it going places? It's going places, Danny explains, because Amos Tversky, who everybody at that moment regards as the smartest man they've ever met. And I mean, that, that is the, the thing that the trope with Amos, every person I talked to him, I talked to about him said he was the smartest man I ever met. One guy, a guy named Dick Nisbet, a sociologist at Michigan, devised an intelligence test, which he said was the shortest intelligence test ever devised. It was, after you meet Amos Tversky, the longer it takes for you to figure out he's smarter than you, the stupider you are. <laughs> uh, um, so, but he's, and he's immensely critical. 
he gen everybody's afraid of him. He's the kind of person that if you say something stupid, he, he he lets you know. But with Danny, he lets his guard down. They close the door and they start laughing. And Danny says the key to the whole relationship was that whatever it was in Amos that caused him to um to to prevent half formed ideas, other people's stupidities, all the rest from entering his mind. He let it go. And we just built a relationship the way two improv comedians would. It was just, it was just, Amos didn't say that's wrong, Danny. When Danny said something, Amos would say, let me think about what that's right about. And um, so they, they, the first lesson in the book is the power of collaboration. And a corollary to that lesson is how in unbelievably difficult people find find it to see the power that when it's some, when a collaboration generates magical stuff. I mean, this is this is a story of academia, but I think it's true outside of academia too. The outside world instantly goes to pick apart at who did what, like who's the real genius, Lennon and McCartney, who's who who actually did it. Um, you know, you, you get this over and over. Um, Gilbert and Sullivan, it's over and over. Who was the actual genius? And the truth is there is none. It, there's something that two people can do together that one person can't do alone. And that should just be respected in and of itself as a thing. And they, this is one of the great collaborations in human history. And it's kind of magical because they're so such, they're, they're such an odd couple. They're so different from each other. Uh, kind of, it shows you the magic of, of this, of what can happen when two people just open each other up to each other. And, um, and also shows you how, how hostile the world is to it, that the world ends up, ends up kind of tearing apart their collaboration by insisting that Amos is responsible for all of it when he wasn't. And it just, it ends up eating at the thing. Uh, so that's the very first thing, the power of collaboration and encouraging that collaboration. And they're not, they're not trying to disentangle it after it produces magical stuff. Um, the lessons of the work, um, the big, you know, if you ask me to describe what they did in a few sentences, it's that they, they showed that people, when they move through the world, um, are not probabilistic thinkers. They are not calculating the odds of this or that happening. They're make they're, even when the odds can be calculated, um, they're, they're thinking in stories and the stories have predictable patterns to them. And those patterns will distort your judgment. Um, and it was the classification of the distortions that they, that they did so well that, you know, you kind of have to read about it to get it, get it all, but it's sort of like how your mind mi might mislead you is a really useful thing to know. Now, Danny would say, even when you know it, you can't do much about it, but, I would say that knowing if you're going to do anything about it, you at least got to know about it. Uh, that not it's, it's that all is not futile. But when you looked at that and you looked at the use of data and you go back to Moneyball, did you or do you actually think that when you translate that into investors and investor behavior, that there are quite a lot of similarities? By which I mean people's a willingness to sort of hook on to stocks that have got a story and you know you know just don't worry about the valuation and that might leave behind a whole section of the market that some might dub as value but suddenly at some point in time they do care about it so um there are so many other people who spent so much time thinking about this in the markets who is so much better equipped than i am to talk about how this actually might be useful to an investor um and there was a lot written about it at the time when the book came out. Also a lot written about Moneyball at the time, that this was, you know, that what was going on in the market for baseball players happened in the market for stocks. Um, I tend to think that the market, at least for stocks, is, is um, it's harder to beat than the market for baseball players was. Um, and I put it this way. There are not a lot of people who I know of who've gotten rich with funds where they have set out with a kind of rule-based approach using Kahneman-Tversky-like thinking 
to beat the market. Uh, I, I think that, um, uh, and I think, so I think I'd be, someone came to me and said, here, Michael, put some money into this fund. We're going to use what, Dan, what Danny and Amos, uh, what Danny and Amos understood to go, to go bet on stocks. I would say, no, thank you. Uh, I, I think it's, I think it's harder than that. I think it's more in your, it's broader than that. It's like in your life, the kind of judgments you wind up making as you're moving through the day. Um, your life just in, is enriched knowing these things your mind is doing. Um, that's not to say that your next guest or who, who actually maybe knows about the markets in ways I don't and is actually in the markets in ways I'm not, doesn't have something to say about this is really useful. It may be that, it, I, and I just don't know about it. I'm just a little wary of it. Um, right. Got it. Got it. So I'm going to ask you a few more uh, general questions. I, I, you are a very successful podcaster, but I have to ask you, why did you want to start a podcast? Well, so there, there's so many different kinds of podcasts. It's odd. They're all grouped together as the same thing. Um, it's different from what you and I are doing, the thing I do. I, what I did is I basically took my long form magazine life and moved it on into audio. Uh, so they're, they're scripted either. I do a seven episode season. Each episode takes me a month uh, anyway. Uh, it's interviewing a whole bunch of people and then writing a script. Um, and the, there's several things I really like about it. One is the audience is there. So it's just got a bigger audience than anything. It's got, I think it's got a bigger audience than my books have now. Um, so that's nice. Um, the second is, I really like the way it causes me to exercise muscles that I might not use if I'm just writing prose on the page. I should use, but that I might not use. Um, and it's 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 the it's writing for the ear. Writing for the ear is different from writing for the eye. And when you're writing for the eye, you should also be writing for the ear, but you can easily forget it. And and the being forced to write for the ear has has had a couple of knock on effects one is just to be just to be a, a little more attuned to how words sound but the other is um to be a, a little more um sensitive to emotion um that the ear is a, a much it, it's just in a more emotional receptor than the eye and it isn't that you can't generate emotion on the page obviously you can it's just that this this medium is a very emotional medium pick up people pick up just from the sound of a person's voice how they're feeling um it, it, if someone so it, it it's um it's for it forces me to think about um what the emotional content of what i'm writing is and sometimes i might forget forget that or let that slide a bit when i'm and i shouldn't when i'm writing a book so I really like, I really like, it's sort of like literary cross training. I really like the muscles that I build when I do it. And the last thing is, I don't know about you, 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 you look like you're all alone there in a room and wherever you are, but I, <laughs> I my, with my podcast, it really is, I've got this group of people, these producers who really know sound. Um, and it's, it's a team sport and writing books is such an individual sport. This is something really, this is back, gets back to collaboration. There's just things that you do when you're collaborating with collaborating people you don't do when you're doing it all by yourself. And I, I really like that feeling. So all combined, you know, if the magazine industry had not collapsed, if Vanity Fair or the New York Times magazine was what it, what it, it was, what it was 20 years ago, I probably wouldn't be doing it. Um, but the magazine industry's collapsed. This new medium has, has arisen. It enables me to learn new things. It's, um, and, and it serves the function that the magazine writing once did for me, which is sort of R and D for the books. Let's me graze. Let's me kind of find, find topics, uh, fiddle around with stuff that I don't want to commit a, to do a book about, but I am really interested in. Right. Well, it's called against the rules. I have listened to a few of your podcasts and I think they're terrific. And I just will say that that team notion you refer to is essential. I, uh, the architect of the Money Moves podcast was Will Campion, and he and the other members of the team have been absolutely a joy to work with, and none of it would have happened. And 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 it's just you know terrific fun, as witnessed by having this conversation you know with you today. Um, so let me ask you some some more general ones. How do you go about allocating and investing your own capital? 
I don't spend, I make a few big decisions and leave it be. So I don't, I, you know, in, the only time I would put any money in an individual stock as opposed to an index or Berkshire Hathaway, which I treat it almost as an index, um, uh, is, is if I want to just have an excuse to follow the stock. Like that, I, I might without I, I might buy a little stock, not because I think it's going to go up or down, but because I might write about it. And like for example, I give you an example. I own a little bit, tiny bit, but still a little bit of Tootsie Roll, candy maker in Chicago, and I bought it because when uh, GameStop went crazy, a a friend of mine who I'd once written a piece about when he was a 15 year old boy and he'd gone into the market and he'd made $700,000 um, from nothing during the internet bubble. He got in touch with me out of the blue and said, watch Tootsie Roll, it's the next GameStop. And I thought, I started looking to Tootsie Roll and it was run by like a 78 year old woman in Chicago. And I thought, she has no idea what's about to hit her. And if, <laughs> if Tootsie Roll is indeed the next GameStop, I wanna be kind of like on top of it and I would go write about it. Now, Tootsie Roll has not been the next GameStop. It's lost me a little money, but just a little money, but it kept me watching it. And so I bought it just to watch it. Um, but mostly, so that's, but that's not really managing my money. That's the, with my money, what I do is I think, how much do I want in the stock markets? How much do I want in municipal bonds? And how much do I want in cash? Maybe a little bit in gold or something else, but just like the buckets. And then I, I put them in the buckets and mostly in indexes and I just let it go. Uh, so I don't spend a lot of time thinking about it. And the truth is, so far as I can tell, it's a perfectly intelligent way to lead your financial life. And I outperform most hedge fund managers. So, <laughs> so I, I, so uh, I, I don't really, I don't really spend a lot of time worrying about it. Got it. Uh, as you've written with the premonition, but all your other books, and you've thought of, thought about leadership, but also sitting there in the U.S., I suppose it begs the question: um, Can the U.S. ever produce a good president again or is the nation too fractured it's a very hard country to lead right now um and uh it, it's not getting easier do you never say never i i, I what well, you know my my problem is i'm just kind of constitutionally optimistic and i, I don't at the same time as you might say, how do we ever get out of this? The tribalism seems worse and worse. The media bubbles seem worse and worse. Um, I don't believe that we're just stuck in this forever. I think that it's going to break like a fever. And uh, there will come a time, usually, probably in response to some existential threat, when the country has to be reunified. And and the re I guess the reason I think that is if you ignore the television set, and ignore social media, and ignore Twitter, and you're just out in the world, in the country, drive across the country and, I don't know, go to kids' sporting events, or uh, or go to conferences, or, you know, it, it, Americans are so intertwined in so many ways that the, the room could be half Trump and half Berkeley liberals. And if you didn't bring up politics, you might, they'd, they'd all get along fine. In fact, they might form fast friendships with these people who they think, you know, in, in theory are the devil. It's, it's not, the, the differences are all on the surface and all um, salient right now. The similarities aren't being paid attention to. And I, I just think the, the, the country's, it's stronger and more interwoven than it appears on the surface. Um, and if it ever really came to it, like if Russia tried to invade, God help them. You know, it's just, I, I just don't think that, that we are, we're that divided a country. And as you think ahead, is there a shocking or scandalous topic you haven't written on yet, but are inclined to? Cryptocurrency. Um, cryptocurrency and the world it is, it is reeking. Uh, it, it, um, the currency, so I was put off by it in the beginning because I, it just didn't work as money. It was not persuasive as money. And the story in the beginning was this is the new money. And the cryptocurrency people have smartly pivoted and figured that's not the story to tell anymore. Or if you want to sell this stuff, you have to have, have different stories. So now it's gold. It's not, it's not money, it's gold. It's a store, <laughs> it's a store of value. And 
I'm not saying it's not. It, it, this is an act of faith, right? The question is how many people will, will agree to believe this and how long will they believe it for? And maybe they'll believe it forever. And maybe this is the new gold. But the, the, it's now reached a, a scope and a size where it's having all these distortive effects on the world. And that really interests me. Uh, so that's, that's something I'm flirting with now. Um, what I, you know, my fantasy is I find another sports book or two that excite me as much as Moneyball on the blind side excited me. Uh, that I'm always open to a sports story precisely because it cuts through the divisions in my country that it, nobody's really got their, their guard up when they're reading a sports story and you can, you can address anything you want to through sports. Um, so, you, and get, and get a general audience. Uh, but so that's what I have in mind and nothing scandalous, unless you think cryptocurrency is scandalous. <laughs> um, and, uh, uh, you haven't written about alternative assets yet, though. So presumably that is that's nurturing away, sort of. Is it, is it somewhere? Well, in, I don't. In you know, right? you're, you're, you think of me as more of a Wall Street writer than I think of me. Crypt, cryptocurrency. Uh, I know it's a Wall Street subject, but it's more than a Wall Street subject. I, if you'd have told me after Liars Poker that you'd never write a Wall Street book again, I said you're probably right. Then the financial crisis happens, and how can you avoid that? I mean, I kind of got pulled back into it. And then Flash Boy's story walks in the door, and I think, how can I not write about that? But um, but I'm not looking for Wall Street subjects. Uh, th th it's really true, I guess, with the exception of Liars Poker. It is really true that the Wall that I do find other subjects, but the Wall Street subjects find me. And um, you tell me when alternative acts, assets is going to come knock on my door and say, "Hey, you have to pay attention to me." Uh, and yeah, maybe. Okay, got it. Um, any advice for an aspiring author listening to this podcast? Um, when young people who want to be writers ask me, how do you become a writer? Um, the simp I have two answers to the question. One is, are you sure you want to write or do you want to be a writer? Um, if you want to write, then just write and you'll do it because you like doing it. If you want to be a writer, um, you probably won't. Uh, it's, 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 if you want the role or the status or whatever you think it is or the lifestyle, but you don't actually sit down and write with pleasure or an interest, um, it's probably not the best idea. So figure out first that you actually want to write and, and then, then you got to write, uh, find things that interest you and write about them and see if you can get them in print. Um, but the second thing is, is, uh, you'll be a much more effective writer if you have lots of experiences in the world. I knew this when I went to work at Solomon Brothers. I just thought the more I, that, ha that I can do that's not just being a writer, the richer the things I write will be for it. So look, don't just stop at being a writer. Go do stuff. Write at night after you've done your stuff. Find, find, go have, just go find experiences, the things that interest you, because um, that will help. Um, author writer to when you find how to find you know it's very hard to just start with a book i, I i'd start small i start with like little pieces uh, that's how i started and then kind of grope your way to the if there's a bigger project in you um yeah so that's pretty simple advice that's all i got okay and my final question michael is if you could go anywhere in the world and have a book in your lap and a glass of wine, where would it be? What would you be drinking? Um, and what would you be reading? I'd be reading the book I just started, uh, which is a novel called Horse by Geraldine Brooks. I got sent the galley and I'm mesmerized by it. Um, and so I'd be, I know I'd be reading that because that's what I want to be reading right now. I would be in, I'd be in Umbria. I'd be in Umbria in like the, the town square of Todi uh, with a, I, do I have to have just one glass of wine? I'd start with a, <laughs> you could have a, start with a dry white and then move on to a red. Uh, and um, so I think that's where I'd be. I loved Italy. I lived in Italy one summer and I never got over it. Um, 
So um, that's not very adventurous. If you ask me the question, where would I go or be where I've never been? India. I've never been to India. And I, I you know, I keep kind of contrive the excuse to go there in some useful way. Um, but uh, so town square of Todi in Umbria with more than one glass of wine in Geraldine Brooks' novel. Fantastic. Well, Michael, it's 37 years since we were at the LSE and you have thrilled and enthralled and delighted millions so you need to keep on writing those books and hopefully they'll make some more films are they going to make a film out of liars poker i mean surely they should even so, now very oddly um the fifth risk has a six-part net netflix series coming out next month that's the next film and the premonition is almost certainly going to happen as a big movie um liars poker I made the mistake of selling it outright, not an op, not optioning it. So I lost the rights entirely to Warner Brothers. And it's just really moldered inside of Warner Brothers for 30 years. And they've tried every now and then. Um, the I assume what I assume is gonna happen with it now, given what's happened in the in the in the entertainment world, it, it's so naturally a TV show rather than a movie. It's so naturally just a series that's set in in 1980s Wall Street, uh, someone will come along and have it and and give it a whirl eventually. But I don't know if anybody's doing it right now. Right. I just want you to know, Michael, that if it happens, I am available. Are you? <laughs> you we'll, we'll cast you. I know exactly who the role you'll play. You'll play John Goodfriend. Oh. You'll be the CEO. Oh you'll my be, gosh. You'll be a, no, I yeah, you'll not. put on 40 or 50 pounds and learn how to smoke a cigar with panache. Uh, but yeah. Okay, go ahead. Fantastic. Well, Michael, I uh, I hope we get together in London. You know when you come on. I'd love to do it. I'd absolutely love to.